And the title of the meeting is The Russian Revolution and the Lessons of October. So uh, our, it's with great pleasure today that I want to introduce our speaker. Uh, he's Alex Kalinikos. He's the editor of the International Socialist Journal, and he's done numerous uh, books, and some of them will be on sale at the back. So uh, Alex Kalinikos. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Now, the original title that I suggested for this meeting was The Lessons of October. It's been slightly extended in the program, but that was my original idea. Well, it wasn't my original idea. It's pinched from the title of a book that Leon Trotsky wrote that I think was published in, in 1922. The implication of the title is that the Russian Revolution of October 1917 is of universal significance. It wasn't just... Um, uh, an event in a past century that was in, that shook things up for a time, but is now largely and thankfully forgotten. No, the Russian Revolution is something of universal significance, and in particular, it's something, and this was what Trotsky, in the thick of the debates, in the leadership of the Bolshevik party, the period after Lenin's death, this was what Trotsky was particularly concerned with. Sorry, I just realized I can't read my watch here, so I have to get my phone out. It's not because I'm quietly on social media. Um, okay. Um, but this view of the Russian Revolution as of universal significance goes completely against the grain of contemporary opinion. Um, in a few days' time, it'll be the 14th of July. Uh, the, the, the great day that is celebrated every year in France, commemorating the storming of the Bastille, which was the beginning of the French Revolution, and which, you know, if you read about the storming of the Bastille, it wasn't a tea party, you know, the people, the Paris crowd attacked this ancient prison, destroyed it, executed the governor, and, and, and so on and so forth. But nevertheless, uh, People who actually hate the idea of revolution today, like Emmanuel Macron, and if he, if he goes, his honored guest, Donald Trump, will be there uh, in the Champs-Élysées celebrating the 14th of July in a, in a few d days' time, and their equivalents in the United States for uh, Independence Day, and so, so on and so forth. This is absolutely not the case uh, when it comes to the October Revolution. And this is true for the, the political and academic establishment. I mean, there's this frightful book edited by a guy called Tony Brenton about the October Revolution, collecting together the ideas of a number of leading historians in the revolution. Most, most of it is drivel. Brenton is a, a diplomat. He used to be the British ambassador to London. You can hear him on the media pontificating all the time. Anyway a woman called Sheila Fitzpatrick, who is an extremely serious historian of the Soviet Union, a bit soft on Stalinism, but a really, really good historian. She wrote a review saying, I sense in Brenton's collection a, a degree of neoliberal triumphalism. And this joke, uh, joker, Brenton, wrote in saying, well, what's wrong with neoliberal triumphalism? If you want to understand why uh, the ruling classes around the world uh, in such trouble at the minute, it's because their brains are provided by the likes of Brenton. But it's not just uh, the establishment that um, finds the October Revol Revolution something they simply want to dismiss or forget about. That's true quite significantly of the left. Um, Eric Hobsbawm, famous Marxist historian, wrote a book, Age of Extremes, whose subtitle was the short 20th century, um, covering the period 1914 to 1991. Part of the implication of that delimitation in time was to treat the October Revolution, one of the key events at the beginning of the short 20th century, as uh, something that is essentially past. Even someone much closer to us, Daniel Bensay, the great French revolutionary Marxist, if you read his writings, repeatedly says the epoch uh, that commenced with the October Revolution is now over. 
And I always, I mean, I never uh, challenged him about him, about it when he was alive. I feel I should have, because it always, I couldn't understand what he was saying there. I mean, there's a sense in which to say the epoch of the Russian Revolution is over is, is valid. You know, it was a long time ago. And moreover, one of its consequences was that the fate of much of the at least subjectively revolutionary left became tied up with the fate of the Soviet Union. The formation of the Communist International, the role of the Communist parties all over the world, very importantly outside Europe in different parts of the global, global South. Um, there, these, this whole project is tied up with the fate of the Soviet Union. So when the Soviet Union sinks in 1991, this drags the communist parties, not all, but to a large extent gra grabs them down, drags them down. It finishes off that particular phase in the history of the left. Not always you go to Greece. There's a robustly Stalinist communist party there. But it's, you know, it's a weird organization in all, all, all sorts of ways. Interestingly, Trotsky predicted this. He said, when the Stalinist regime collapses in the Soviet Union, that will bring down the communi communist movement. He thought optimistically that that would release new revolutionary forces that would take, finally take on and finish capitalism off. But he expected the fall of Stalinism to bring down the international communist movement as well. So th if that's what Daniel was talking about, that's fair enough. But does it mean to say that the epoch of the Russian Revolution is over, does that mean it has nothing to tell us revolutionary socialists, anti-capitalists more broadly, seeking to change society today? And I think that th those who believe this, and this is true of much of the left, much of the left have really forgotten about the centenary of the Russian Revolution. Tariq Ali, to his credit, has written an interesting book about Lenin um, for the centenary, but he's very much the exception in this. The implication of ignoring the October Revolution is that it is of no relevance to us today. This is a huge mistake, and it's a huge mistake for the following reason. How are we going to achieve socialism? How are we going to achieve a just and emancipated society? Are we going to achieve it through a process of reform that gradually removes the obnoxious features of the existing system, or will the ever revolutionary overthrow of the system be, be necessary? This is the classic question posed by Rosa Luxemburg at the beginning of the 20th century, social reform or revolution. It's still a living question today, and a majority of the left uh, take the path of social reform. You know, we all love Jeremy Corbyn at Marxism, quite rightly. He's played a magnificent role as leader of the Labour Party. But much though we love him, we have to say he's a left reformist. He thinks that you can change society radically within the framework of the existing system, the constitutional order, all that, ki all that kind, of, kind of stuff. Uh, much though I admire Jeremy Corbyn, I think he's wrong about this. I think the lessons of, you know, if we talk about history, history shows that left reformism doesn't work. And it doesn't show that, you know, it shows that over a long historical period, but you don't have to study history in depth. Just go back two years ago to look at the way in which the European Union destroyed the Syriza government in Greece. I mean, the Syriza government is still there, Alexis Tsipras is still Prime Minister of Greece, but he's essentially the agent of the Troika, or the, even more than that, the different groups of bastards who are trying to bleed Greece, die in a, a Freudian slip, to, are trying to bleed Greece dry in order to re-establish uh, neoliberal capitalism, not just in Greece, but on a, on a European and indeed indeed glo global basis. So left reformism has been tested again and again, and it's been defeated. That means, I think, that if you want to achieve a just, emancipated society without all the horrors of capitalism, you need a revolution. If that's so, then we should look in particular 
at the first successful socialist revolution. That was in Russia in October 1917. Simply by vir virtue of the workers taking power and overthrowing the capitalist system, even if it was, was for a short while, even if it was a few years, for that very reason, we need to, to take, it, take it very, very seriously. Indeed, I think that that was the only time capitalism has been successfully overthrown. Uh, lots of people on the left disagree about this. They'll talk about China and Cuba and so on. That's an important debate to have, but that, nevertheless, this is what I, I believe myself. So if, you, if Russia was, at the very least, the first successful socialist revolution, why shouldn't we study what happened there very carefully and try to learn from it? Now, there's the argument it was a special case. It's a special case because Russia was so backward in 1917. This vast peasant society dominated by an autocratic regime closely linked with an extremely paras parasitic and exploitive uh, landowning class. This is just so uh, alien to the contemporary world that um, Russia in 1917 has nothing to say to us now. Big mistake to think about that. There is one great, really great, there are lots of good books about the Russian Revolution. There's one really great one, written by Leon Trotsky, one of the leaders of that revolution a few years later, the history of the Russian Revolution. And Trotsky starts that book by analyzing what he calls uneven and combined development. In other words, the way in which Russia was integrated into the global capitalist system. Of course, it, was, it had its peculiarities, um, but the struggle of the Tsarist state to maintain itself against its rivals, the, the more advanced great powers to the west of, of Russia, forced the Tsarist regime to advo import advanced techniques precisely from the west in the late 19th century. That means borrowing money, particularly from French bankers, to import, Im, import advanced industrial machinery and sometimes also the skilled workers to operate that machinery to build up a powerful industrial base for the Russian state. And this process is reinforced by the, um, by the war and the need to build up a war industry to wage the struggle against Germany and Austria-Hungary after, after 1914. That means that Russia is a tinderbox because it combines within its borders um, all the ancient brutal oppression characteristic of the Tsarist autocracy, but it also uh, involves the contradictions of a developed uh, industrial capitalist eco economy. Is this an, an exceptional situation? No, if you look at the global south, you can see that kind of combination again and again. If you want to understand what happened in Egypt in 2011 and the eventual, we hope, temporary defeat of the revolution that broke out there, you have to see the processes of uneven and combined development at work there. But the element of combined development, the extent to which Russia is integrated into the rest of the global capitalist economy is crucial for understanding not just the revolution of 1917, but also its predecessor, the, revo the unsuccessful revolution of, of 1905. But because at the core of that revolution is the industrial working class, a minority of the population, but politically very advanced and capable of forming already in 19... Uh, 1905, organs of workers' power, organs of workers' self-government, the Soviets that Lenin grasps in April 1917 will be the basis of a real workers', workers state. The Russian workers, through their mass struggles, invent, as Marx put it about the Paris Commune, the political form for their economic em em emancipation. And that, didn't make, that made the Russian workers really advanced. They were ahead of their counterparts in the rest of Europe. But the, their counterparts in the rest of Europe were involved in their say, those same rhythms of struggle. There's a great book by Steve Smith 
the historian who's going to be speaking at the conference the SWP is organizing for the anniversary, the centenary of the Russian Revolution in November, a great book he wrote years ago called Red Pet Petrograd, which, in which he analyzes the, and describes how this very advanced and combative working class develops in the factories of Petrograd. But you can see their counterparts elsewhere in Europe, in Glasgow, in Sheffield, in Berlin, in Turin, in all the key industrial centers of Europe during the First World War, where the war brings the normal class contradictions to, to a head, you see similar patterns of struggle. The difference was that not that the Russians were more backward than the others, but because, as Lenin himself analyzed when the Tsarist mon monarchy was overthrown in February 1917, the contradictions were so con concentrated in Russia that the place blew up, blew up first. And also, the other thing, if we look at the revolution, is, I mean, there's all this nonsense, the Tony Brentons of this world, about the October 1917, the overthrow of the provisional government, the taking of power by the Soviets being a coup engineered by the Bolsheviks and so, and so on and so forth. This is nonsense. There's another great book by Alexander Rabinovich called The Bolsheviks Come to Power. And he describes the way in which in, in the period between February and October 1917, there's this interaction between the working class and also the section of the peasantry, the majority of the population, who are in the army and therefore concentrated um, in large numbers, often close to the big cities, and are therefore open to the political influence of what's happening among the working class in the cities. You see this process of constant radicalization that leads to the further advance and strengthening of Soviet organization. And interacting with this is the development of the Bolsheviks, not as a narrow group of crazy conspirators or anything like that, but as a mass party, a party of... 300,000 by the time uh, the Bolsheviks led the revolution in October, October 1917. Sorry, if you find the dates confusing, they are confusing because there's the old calendar that Russia was still on, one sign of backwardness, uh, according to which the Russian revolution took place on the 25th of October 1917. But according to the modern Western can calendar, the revolution takes place on the 7th of November 1917. Very sorry about that. Nothing that we can do about that. It's the October Revolution, like it, like it or not. But you have this interaction between party and class that is the driving force of the, 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 the revolutionary, revolutionary process. Now, so, and this provides a model to those radicalized workers in other parts of Europe and indeed in other, uh, other parts of the world. You can see, I think there have been meetings about this, that you can see all, all over the world, in South Africa, in Latin America, in India, in China, the revolution having huge reverberations because the, of the model of working class self-emancipation that it offers. Does that mean, so far, so what I've been doing is insisting on the universality of the, October, of the October Revolution. Were there peculiarities? Yes, they were. The real peculiarities I'd like to stress are twofold. First of all, this takes place during the First World War. As I said, the experience of war, and in particular the catastrophe that the war was for the Tsarist state, all the decadence and incompetence and brutality and selfishness and inefficiency of the Tsarist regime, summed up by the Tsarist family themselves, the imperial family themselves. And one of the puke-making thing of the centenary is you're, we're sure to have programs about these wonderful people, the Romanovs, and how dedicated they were to the, their people and how awful it was that the Bolsheviks bunched, bumped them off and so on and so forth. Uh, this completely decadent dynasty and their hangers-on exposed themselves to everyone through the the way in which they took Russia into war and were a unable to wage it effectively. Now, the war plays, I think, a double role in the whole revolutionary process. And let's remember that the, the 1914 war is the beginning of an epoch of wars, 
that go either between states or civil wars that go on until 1945. The, the, the war is significant, I think, in two ways. First of all, it has a radicalizing effect. The provisional government that takes power after the Tsarist monarchy, don't, they don't take power, they take office, um, is committed to remaining loyal to their Western allies, Britain and France and later the United States. So they press on with the war. This is hugely radicalizing because why people rebelled in February 1917 was they wanted the, the war to end. And the fact that the Bolsheviks are the only serious party that promises to end the war is a crucial factor in their success. But secondly, the war and what follows it, the civil war in Russia itself, where the opponents of the October 1917 revolution try to destroy the new Bolshevik Republic, has um, reshapes Russia pol politically. And we see this happening on a larger European scale. The war, this process of interstate and civil war has a tremendously brutalizing effect. It leads to a militarization of society and of politics. This is one crucial factor in the development of fascism. The fascists came out, uh, many of their first recruits were people who'd served in the shock troops that made the advances in the barbaric trench warfare that was waged between 1914 and 1918, but also the Bolsheviks themselves, in trying to stay in power, waging the civil war successfully, are militarized, develop a much more hierarchical structure, uh, there's much greater necessity for discipline and so on. This is a crucial factor in shaping the course of the revolution. The second peculiarity, reformism is very weak in Russia. You don't have the kind of mass social democratic parties that you have in Western, Western Europe. This is something that Lenin himself emphasizes. He says famously in left-wing communism that it'll t because of reformism, it'll take much longer to move between February and October in Western Europe. In other words, the process of winning a majority of the working class to revolution will take much longer because we'll be fighting reformism. But the period after October will be much easier because in Western Europe you have much more advanced industry and so on. Now, I think that's true, but you can over, over, overstate, um, overstate this because one of the things that we've seen more recently is in great working class struggles how rapidly reformist formations can develop. So we see in the case of Solidarność in Poland in the early 1980s, the very rapid development of a, a reformist ideology and practice and strategy within the, the, this new gigantic quasi-Soviet with a small s. Most of the leaders of um, Solidarność would have had a heart attack if you'd called them a Soviet movement in the sense of something that had anything to do with the, the Soviet Union, but also South Africa, where you see very advanced struggles by workers and youth in the course of the 1980s that break the back of the apartheid regime simultaneously, and within it, you get the very rapid development of a reformist trade union bureaucracy of the South African Communist Party as essentially a mass social democratic party, which has huge implications for the, um, the limiting cap limited character of the changes that come when apartheid ends. And this, the capacity for reformism to grow very quickly fundamentally reflects a tendency of workers' struggles to limit themselves, to, to um, confine themselves to strike, winning improvements within the system, reflecting workers' lack of self-confidence in their own ability to reconstruct society. And we can see this also in Russia in 1917, how ex-revolutionary parties like the Mensheviks and social revolutionaries, who could be more revolutionary than social revolutionaries, in effect become reformist parties conciliating between the forces of reaction and the, um, uh, and the, the for forces, forces of revolution. Why I go on about this is because the crisis, we've seen how the crisis is volatilizing political structures at the present time um, that mean that it's much harder to talk about strongly entrenched reformist parties anymore. Reformist parties in present conditions can collapse overnight. Look at what happened to PASOK in Greece. Look at what happened to the French Socialist Party 
uh, humiliated in the presidential elections, its own candidate has left the Socialist Party. I mean, that's a real statement of confidence in, in the Socialist Party. So you can have social, long established social democratic parties disintegrating. You can also have them appearing almost overnight. Think of Podemos, or revitalizing themselves in the way in which we see um, la labor under, under Corbyn. So reformism is a tremendously important reference point, but I think that's true in any revolutionary process. And one can overstate the differences between Russia in 1917 and certainly the conditions we find ourselves today. The key question is whether reformism can offer a way out of the kind of crisis that society fa finds itself in today. And the answer is that it, it can't. And that means we have to look to what the Russian Revolution of October 1917 can tell us. There were two crucial innovations in that revolution, one of which proved universal, the Soviets. The Soviets became the model of mass self-emancipation, constantly being reinvented in different struggles around the world. Even in Egypt in 2011, we see the beginnings of that kind of workers' self-organization, popular self-organization, and, and so on, developing in conditions where you know, socialist revolution isn't supposed to happen in societies like Egypt, but no one told the Egyptian masses that. So the Soviet form proved some, something that could be applied or that could develop el anywhere. The other innovation uh, w was much harder to universalize, and that's the kind of party that the Bolsheviks were. So what kind of party were the Bolsheviks? Here, it's useful to quote Karl Kautsky, the great theorist of the Second International. He drew a distinction between revolutionary parties and revolution-making parties. This was when he was at his most left wing. There are people who think that Kautsky really shaped Lenin. He did shape Lenin, actually. And that Lenin really simply implemented the ideas that Kautsky had, had developed earlier. That is certainly, certainly not true, as I'm going to try and bring out. For Kautsky, a revolutionary party is what parties like German and Russian social democracy before the First World War should be, mass parties of the working class that ride the wave of history, history through a gradual process of transformation that will eventually get rid of capitalism without revolution. That's a revolutionary party for, for Kautsky. He doesn't say what a revolution-making party would be, but it's what he disapproves of. We shouldn't be a revolution-making party. Well, the Bolsheviks bloody wear a revolution-making party, and they wear already in 1905. One of the things they do is organize an insurrection in Moscow, which was unsuccessful and was denounced by the rest of the left and so on, but they were determined to smash the Tsarist state. They were determined to shape the whole revolutionary process not to ride along on its back, but to direct it. Not to substitute themselves for it, but to, but to take it in a particular direction. And we see this, of course, again in 1917. And for me, the most important example of this is not the actual insurrection itself, although, of course, the Bolsheviks organized it. How do you think states get overthrown? They don't overthrow themselves. You have to organize and plan to get, ri get rid of a state. That's not a coup. Much more important is what happens between April and October 1917. In April 1917, Lenin returns from exile, thanks. Um, and he, he says, what we have to aim to do is overthrow the provisional government. This shocks all the rest of the left, including most of the leaders of the Bolshevik party. This is outrageous. We've had this democratic breakthrough, we've overthrown the Tsar, now we can have a progress to bourgeois democracy in Russia. Isn't that enough for you, Lenin? And Lenin says, no, no, what's on the agenda? Because of how the Tsar was overthrown, because the Tsar was overthrown by mass working class action, soldiers, mutinies, and the formation of Soviets, Soviet power, a socialist revolution is on the agenda. So he puts, puts the benchmark as high as possible. We can carry through a socialist revolution. But he says, uh, only a minority of the working class 
will agree with us on this. He was right about that, since lots of people in his own party didn't agree with him. What we have to do is to win the majority to winning, to taking over, to, to the objective of their taking power. And he uses this crucial phrase, we must patiently explain to our fellow workers about the necessity of Soviet power. Patiently explain. In other words, the Bolsheviks, as revolutionaries, in their different factories, in the army barracks, and so on and so forth, should be talking to their fellow workers, uh, their fellow soldiers, about why it was necessary for the Soviets to take power and why they had to organize to take power. And go through the practical experience of struggle with their fellow workers and soldiers to help their fellow workers and soldiers understand the necessity of taking power. This is closely uh, linked to the use of the United Front tactic. I mean, this was something that for was formalized later, but you see the Bolsheviks doing that. When the counter-revolutionaries tried to stage a coup under a rather vain and stupid general called Kornilov in August 1917, the Bolsheviks unite with the people who've been persecuting them, trying to arrest and maybe kill Lenin, for, for example, in order to stop the coup, and in the process, by proving that you can't trust the provisional government or the generals, they win the majority of the working class to taking, taking power. That constant practical dialogue between the Revolutionary Party and the mass of work, the working class is, is, is absolutely, ab absolutely crucial. Just very quickly, because I've got to stop and I'm rabbiting on too much. The, the problem was that this model of a revolution-making party that lives through its interaction with the rest of the working class proved hard to export, certainly quickly. The Communist International was a magnificent attempt to do so, but it failed. And it failed partly because of the prestige and power of the Bolsheviks over the other new communist parties that were formed. People were too inclined to defer to the Russians rather than learn from themselves. Lenin never deferred to anyone. He took his own path, but unfortunately there weren't enough revolutionary leaders elsewhere um, who developed the confidence quickly enough to, to, to do that. And then, uneven and combined development, the integration of Russia into the global capitalist system, which had helped revolution in 1905 and 1917, now turns against the revolution. And the power of the global capitalist system eventually destroys the revolution in a totally unexpected form. State capitalism, the transformation of the Bolshevik, let's not call it the Bolshevik party, the Communist Party, uh, from a shell of real revolutionaries into the memory of real revolution into a new ruling class subordinating Russia to the logic, the logic of, of uh, capital, capital accumulation. But this terrible historical tragedy doesn't undermine the validity of the Bolshevik ex experience. Um, we can st still learn from it, not mechanically, critically, selectively. That's how our tradition is carried on, not by saying, oh, we must bow down at the cult of Lenin and Trotsky and the Bolsheviks, and how great they were. We look critically at the experience and we see what we can learn from and we see what isn't valid today. But the challenge of revolutionary politics today is on the one hand to oppose the right, people like Trump and May, but at the same time to relate to the new left reformist politics in the process winning larger and larger sections who are now inspired by Corbyn or Mélenchon or Podemos or whatever to, to revolutionary politics. In that context, Lenin's formula of patiently explain, work with people, but argue with them politically is very, very relevant. Thank you. I just wanted to um, raise the question of women in the Russian Revolution because it's a question that supports a lot of the points Alex was making. In large swathes of pre-revolutionary Russia, women were considered to be less than human. So a popular saying went, I thought I saw two people walking down the road, but it was just a man and his wife. That women were considered to be beasts of burden. And yet women played a very important role in the Russian Revolution. 
the women Bolshevik leaders who had spent years in exile working in the underground movement who came back to Russia after the February Revolution and the women in the working class movement who'd been brought into the factories to replace the men as they were sent off to work all played a very key role and the um, conventional historical view is that women got the ball rolling in February 1917, women got things going with the International Women's Day March, but then they handed it back over to the men to carry out the really important business of taking power. And that is a mistaken view, because Alexandra Kolontai and her work amongst the soldiers' wives and the laundresses who were on strike um, throughout April and May in, in uh, Petrograd all of those things fed into the Russian Revolution. Some of the um, Bolshevik women leaders, Elena Stasova was the secretary of the Communist Party in uh, St. Petersburg in 1917, and a lot of the women went on to be leaders in the Red Army, which when you think what the prevailing attitudes were, for women Bolsheviks to lead men into battle was an astonishing achievement. Eugenia Bosch was one of them, and Victor Serge said she was one of the greatest military leaders of the revolution. Another was Larissa Reisner, and again Trotsky talked about her as a bright comet that burnt across the sky because of her talents and her abilities. And it seems to me that if the Russian Revolution was a coup, these women would never have fought for the Red Army. Something, um, men were conscripted into the Red Armies, women weren't, but tens and thousands went and fought because they saw in the revolution the chance of a better life. To go from being considered to be a beast of burden to leading men into battle, to playing a role inside the Soviets. And so when you look at what the revolution achieved for women, um, within months of the revolution, divorce was legalized. Homosexuality was legalized. Women had already had the vote. They got universal suffrage. In 1921 in Russia, abortion was legalized. It was not legalized in this country or America for decades and decades and decades. And therefore, when you think about the potential for liberation through class struggle, through united action against the system, and through transforming the system, not just piecemeal, the slow and peaceful road that Rosa Luxemburg uh, contrasted with the revolutionary road, the revolutionary road achieved more for women in that incredibly backward and difficult circumstance than decades and decades and decades of patiently and um, politely campaigning. Uh, can, can comrades keep their contributions to three minutes and I'll tap after they've done two minutes. And after John will be Joe Woodward and uh, Charles from Quebec, Canada. Well, first, I'd like to, to uh, thank the last speaker for that excellent contribution. It seems to me that the revolution virtually invented modern feminism. Aside from that, um, the uh, problem, the question is, and always has been, as Lenin asked, Stord Yelat, what is to be done? And my uh, question made many concerned with the present status of the Communist Party in Russia. It's managed to hang on. It was uh, I, Yeltsin tried to destroy it, but uh, somehow it managed to revive. I don't quite know how, but it seems to be a rather, it's a big opposition party, but it seems to be rather quiescent at the moment, and I'm hoping for a revival of it. So my question to Alex would be, what are the prospects for a, a left-wing revival in Russia? I'd want to get rid of these so-called reformers and Navalny people who are, are merely like Gad, but really a lot of the people who get up in Russia are merely various oligarchs trying to muscle in on the political situation. And I, I did give a talk at the uh, Conway Hall Ethical Society last Sunday called Putin in Perspective, which went down very well. But, of course, the problem with Putin, as he self-declared, he's not a socialist. And he has not been able to... He's come to a sort of deal with the oligarchs, but he's, he's had to restrain them somewhat, but really he's playing along with most of them. So the situation has not very much changed. But it was true that after they got rid of Yeltsin, who was absolutely... was so bad that when I was in Moscow, I... I was looking for an opportunity to pee on his grave. Um, but 
the Yelp, that, that legacy is still there. He's not quite eliminated it. So um, I think we've got to look for successors to Putin, but I uh, hope they'll come from the left. Yeah. Um, I brought along a couple of quotes which basically come from opposite sides of the barricades. One's from Tony Cliff and the other's from Trotsky. So I just want to say a few words by way of introducing them. Um, because the SWP leadership really have zero credentials to talk about the Russian Revolution as being part of their history. The, um, the Cliff Tendency was founded on the, the theory of state capitalism, which was um, generated by hostility to the social gains of the Russian Revolution. And this so-called theory was then used to rationalize um, what happened, the position that they took in 1950, when the Labour government was ruling Britain for the, uh, for the ruling the empire and sent troops to fight the Koreans and later the Chinese. Now, Cliff's group was rightly expelled from the Fourth International for refusing to defend North Korea and China against imperialism. It's a fact. Both of these are amongst the deformed worker states where capitalism was overthrown. Now this, despite bureaucratic misrule, this was a historic gain for the international proletariat. And as Trotskyists, the Sparsist League stand for unconditional military defense of China and North Korea. North Korea is under grave threat from the imperialists today, as you'll know if you listen to the news. And so, so as part of that unconditional military defense, we're also for their development of nuclear weapons. Without, without nuclear weapons, North Korea would look like the whole of the Near East today. So, um, to introduce the first quote by Tony Cliff, hatred of the worker states has always been the hallmark of the, um, of the SWP and before that the Cliff tendency. So this is what Cliff said. And I say no, no, we have nothing to do with bloody Russia because it is not a source of strength. So, but, can you sum up, please? For the, for the SWP, okay, I'll just finish with the Trotsky quote. Yeah. For the SWP, the, work, the Stalinist bureaucracy has always been a greater enemy than imperialism. That's what third campism means. And this is what, this is what Trotsky said in the class nature of the Soviet state. Every political tendency that waves its hands hopelessly at the Soviet Union under the pretext of its non-proletarian character runs the risk of becoming the passive instrument of imperialism. Those who can't defend old gains will never make new ones. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, my name is Charles. I'm from the uh, Trotskyist League in Quebec and Canada, uh, the International Communist League. Uh, for us in the ICL, the Russian Revolution is a model. It's not an interesting historical anecdote. Uh, despite its status degeneration, the gains of October were embodied uh, in the uh, Soviet Union until its collapse in 1991-92. At the time, the ICL, the International Communists, fought in the Soviet Union and around the world to spike Boris Yeltsin's counter-revolution and at the same time sweep away the re remnants of the uh, Stalinist bureaucracy and return the, the uh, Soviet Union to the road of Lenin and Trotsky. The SWP, they cheered capitalist restoration, saying Front, line, uh, front page headline, communism has collapsed, it should have every socialist rejoicing, i.e. social democrats. <clears throat> Since the collapse of the Soviet Union, the world has become a much more dangerous place. Just look at the Near East, and the SWP shares as its chair of responsibility for that. This was not an aberration. Not only did you support uh, anti-communist, anti-Soviet movement like Solidarność, you also supported the uh, Mujahideen anti-women cutthroats in Afghanistan. So the over, to overthrow capitalism, we need more October Revolution around the world, led by a vanguard party of the, of the Bolshevik type, not an anti-communist social democratic obstacle like the SWP. Thank you. Uh, after Joshua will be uh, Lewis uh, Flynn from Bo uh, Boxton. Okay. Oh, Brixton, yeah. Thank you. I thought we had you. a branch in Boxton. <laughs> 
Just a quick contribution to the presentation of um, Alex. Uh, in reference to some historians who believed that um, the age or perhaps the epoch of um, Russian Revolution is over. Uh, I'm reading this book by you know um, this uh, important Russian historian Roy Medev, Medvedev. Okay, let history judge. Uh, there, uh, Victor Hugo made a remark that history does not have waste break. I mean, the waste um, basket. And to say that history does not have waste basket means that it is a living subject, and we continue to learn from the wellspring of its lessons. And I believe that it is in the spirit of the Russian Revolution and the lessons of the past that we are gathered here today to continue with the agitation in the interest of the working people to liberate the, you know, the working class people from the oppression of the ruling class. Thank you. Uh, Lewis will be followed by uh, Mao Trong from Nottingham. Uh, yeah, so I've been kind of having debates with friends about the Russian Revolution in general. And one thing they always bring up is the, the social revolutionaries and how they, I think they won an election and then the Bolsheviks had their revolution. And they, they, they use that as an example of why that's a coup, because they kind of deposed a democratically elected government. So I just wanted to ask, who were the social revolutionaries? What were they doing? And why were they not the solution? And why, why was it justified? Thank you. Uh, and may I be followed by Joseph Chinara. <clears throat> uh, uh, Daniel Ben Said, ben Said uh, was mentioned, and therefore my, my question is based on the notion of time. Um, in, in terms of time, because we are talking about revolutionaries, or, or sorry, we're talking about one specific revolution that we are interested in, um, and, and because capitalism is, is a system whereby uh, the, 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 the centrifugal forces will pull in other areas of the world into its orbit, and we don't really have a choice in a way but to be connected as a whole. I, I was just thinking uh, if, if uh, Alex Kunikos could expand on the notion of, um, the, because since we are Trotskyists and, and we have to talk about uneven and combined development, I, I was thinking in terms of consciousness of the working class and, and the notion of uh, time and the notion of change, how how should we go about, as a party, furthering uh, the collectivity as well as the fact that the people's material interests will input and will impact upon, upon their consciousness? Uh, Joseph will be followed by Selma. Yeah, in a way, it touches on what the previous uh, speaker asked, because I think the really serious question we have to debate here is not the question of the social gains of North Korea, but, but, the, but the, um, the question of the relationship between the kind of party that Lenin uh, and Trotsky were part of and the mass spontaneous movement in Russia, and what we can generalize from that today. Because one of the things the 20th century has proven again and again is that every great revolution begins as a mass spontaneous rebellion and that capitalism again and again creates the conditions in which revolutions will emerge. But no revolution in history has ever ended spontaneously. Revolutions end when one side or another imposes itself over society and by and large in the 20th century what that has mean, meant in practice is the old ruling class imposing itself on society and that does not simply mean that things go back to normal, but it means that the ruling class will extract a terrible price from those who dared to threaten its rule. That's the lesson of the 20th century. And again and again, we've paid the price as a working class in terms of the broken bodies of those people who have paid from revolutions being half made and not carried through. And the crucial lesson, therefore, from, from, from Russia in 1917 is it does not need to be this way. It doesn't need to be this way, provided we can create within the working class an organization that can relate to the spontaneous upheaval of the working class and drive it in a particular direction. And there are two crucial elements for which the Revolutionary Party is indispensable. 
The first is, as Lenin Trotsky points out, there is an uneven consciousness in the working class, and therefore there will be a battle of ideas at every stage in the revolution. Therefore, we have to find a mechanism for drawing together all those workers who want to deepen the revolutionary process and drive it forwards to win over wider layers of people in the working class. There is no me mechanism of doing that without organization. Secondly, at crucial moments of the revolution, the question of the state will come to the fore. And the state is a, is a highly centralized organization. If we want to win in that context, we have to be able to draw together those spontaneous struggles and give them an overall direction and centralization as well. You can't improvise that in a revolutionary situation. You have to have a revolutionary party built in every section of the working class that can draw together those struggles. And I think these lessons, whatever has changed in the last 100 years, still apply very much today. Think about the most favorable scenario for a Corbyn government. Two things. First of all, there will be a, a, bat, a desperate battle against the ruling class to actually wrest the kind of demands that Corbyn talks about uh, from a venal and nasty ruling class that exists in Britain. And at every stage will be a battle for ideas in the working class. Do we move, move forwards? Do we rely on the ruling class? And so on. Secondly, the state. Alex quoted in the opening rally of Marxism a serving army general who wrote in the, in the, uh, in the Times in Britain, if Jeremy Corbyn gets elected, the British army will not stand for it. The state will be no less nasty, repugnant in Britain than it was in Russia in 1917 than it, than it has been in many other revolutionary situations. We still need today an organization that could draw together those struggles, give them a direction, and challenge a venal, nasty capitalist class and a state in, in, in Britain. The challenge of building revolutionary organization is alive and well today in 2017. Uh, it was just a simple question, but uh, Joseph has answered to some of them, but anyway, I'll repeat it. Um, the thing is that uh, reformism created also lots of, I would say, um, I don't know how to say it in English, but failures and people who are very critical of the fact that, yeah, reformists like betrayed us, etc. So especially I can talk about the situation in France, but I think it can apply to everywhere some reliance of the movement itself and the development of autonomous group and autonomous organizations, which, mean, which means that for um, revolutionaries, we have to deal with both of these trends. So how do we practically uh, deal with both of these trends who happen to be like very uh, contradictory within the movements and very conflicting? Thank you. Uh, Selma's followed by uh, Christian Hogsberg and uh, John Parrington after that. Yeah. Thanks. Um, just a technical point. I think Alex mentioned that Lessons of October was, came out in 1922 um, in, by Trotsky. It was, I think it was 1924 because he was writing in part because of the experience of German uh, revolution and, and the, the failure of the German Communist Party of what was left of it um, uh, in 1923 to actually make their German October uh, in 1923 because of uh, they were inexperienced. You know, they didn't. They, they were trying to improvise building a revolutionary party during the period 1918 to uh, 1923, and therefore they made all sorts of mistakes. No, most notably, I mean, in the earlier period, uh, you know, part of the reason why you need a revolutionary party is because the ruling class, you know, they have state infiltration and stuff. They know who the leaders of, rev you know, the kind of embryonic revolutionary parties are. They were able to basically murder Rosa Luxemburg, Karl Liebknecht in the earlier wave and stuff because there wasn't a big enough party to basically protect uh, those kind of leaders. But uh, my, my main point I wanted to make was about how reformism can grow within revolutions and what it might look like in a, in a British situation. I mean, it's unthinkable, really, Corbyn. Um, I, I imagine, you know, what, a couple of years, more than a couple of years ago, what, what would a British revolution look like? And you imagine, you know, it would throw up a left reformist government. You'd have Corbyn, you know, you'd have the Prime Minister, you know, you know John McDonnell as Chancellor or something like that, and what that would look like. We've got that, you know, potential of that kind of government, as Joseph said now, which is kind of unthinkable. But in a revolutionary situation, all sorts of 
institutions would try and model themselves as, as socialists and try and get on board with the idea of being socialist overnight. You'd have the Daily Mail would be calling itself a socialist paper just as the height of stop the war. If you remember, it tried to ally itself and say the silent majorities on the march because it's such a mass movement. Even most unlikely people were trying to be would try and get in on the act. Banks would unfurl red flags in Britain and pretend to be socialist and tough. You have see confusion about what is social and what is genuine socialism. And I think one of the dangers for for, for, for in, in a situation like Britain or, or, or in where, where you've got potential for, uh, in, in, you know, where we've got long traditions of reformism to deal with in a revolutionary situation, uh, if it was ever going to happen, would be, you know, you'd have masses of young, you know, masses of people would, would join parties like the SWP because they'd be attracted to those kind of revolutionary ideas. So, you know, ideas would fit big time in a revolutionary situation, but it mildly. We'd attract a lot of things, but there'd be that temptation, there'd be that pressure for, for, for parties like to grow massively, parties like the SWP, other Marxist parties, to grow massively in a revolutionary situation, but the danger would always be to basically, you know, why not join the government? Why not be enter a government? You know, we'd have that opportunity. You'd start getting you know, SWP members elected to parliament. Why not do that? And I think that, well, you know, one of the lessons of, you know, October is the importance of maintaining, you know, independent revolutionary organisation. I don't know if I've got any time left. One, make one final point? No. Just one time. One final point. You know, the tragedy of the Russian Revolution is this. You know, the Bolsheviks were per persecuted by the Tsarist regime. They found themselves in, you know, in, in all sorts of camps, exiled in places like Siberia and stuff under Tsarism. You know, brutal persecution, exile, uh, living camps. They, the tragedy of the thing is they found often those same revolutionaries would find themselves in the same uh, prisons, in the, the actual prison buildings, in the same kind of camps in Siberia under under Stalinism, the rise of Stalinism. You know, that's the ultimate tragedy. You have a, you know, you, the ultimate contradiction, a proletarian revolution and then a state capitalist counter-revolution. You know, that's, that's where the ideas of state capitalism came from. They were asked, not by, you know, Cliff didn't invent the theory of state capitalism. The question of state capitalism was asked by former Bolshevik revolutionaries uh, in camps like Vorkuta in the 1930s, grappling with what is Stalinism. That's where those ideas came from. Okay. Right, thank you. Christy. Uh, and John will be the last speaker in this uh, session. Yeah, I just wanted to talk about the role of intellectuals in the Russian Revolution and make the case that there was actually an intellectual renaissance after the revolution because I work at Oxford University and I think you do get a lot of disdain amongst some academics about the revolution. Partly because of a misunderstanding about you know, the idea of it's a coup and that kind of thing, not a, a mass workers uh, uprising and workers taking power. But I think also it, it's based on you know, looking at the, the Stalinist uh, Stanley's Russia and looking at what happened to intellectuals that they were persecuted the rest of it and that's completely opposite of what actually happened in the first years of the revolution so many uh, intellectuals were inspired by the revolution particularly scientists I, I know about there's an article I've written in the ISJ this this uh, this quote about it and I think this quote by the psychologist Alexander Luria really shows the inspiration that uh, the revolution had for intellectuals so he says I began my career in the first years of the great Russian revolution from the outset, it was apparent I would have little opportunity to pursue the kind of well-ordered, systematic education that serves as the cornerstone for most scientific careers. In its place, life offered me the fantastically stimulating atmosphere of an active, rapidly changing society. And actually, people like Luria and, and Migotsi completely transformed our idea of how the mind works through other discoveries in genetics, environmentalism, the first uh, nature park was set up in the Soviet Union. There were massive kind of changes uh, in, in, in science that came out of the, uh, the, 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 the revolutionary inspiration. Um, but I think what we have to then look at is, well, what happened when Stalin came to power? Because we saw really then a clampdown on this, uh, on this kind of uh, free thinking, this, you know, this, uh, uh, this inspirational movement. And so you had things like Lysenko uh, came to power in, in Russia in genetics, com completely come up with pseudo-scientific uh, ideas. One of the leading pioneers of genetics uh, in the world, Vavilov, was imprisoned in a, uh, a prison and, and died of starvation. Uh, Voloshinov, who was one of the main philosophers of language that transformed our ideas about how, how the mind works, was in a, died in a labor camp. But I think we can, and so I think that's important to say when people apologize for Stalinism and say it was some kind of perfect society. It wasn't just the labor camps, it was actually smashed a whole, you know, it, 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 all these intellectual areas. But I think we can still be inspired 
by the Russian Revolution and the, the great ideas that are on the intellectual front that came out of it, because it wasn't just about ideas, it wasn't just about new ideas about the mind, it was all aimed at trying to improve the practical lives of people. So, for instance, in education, uh, Vygotsky's theories uh, were still you know, valid today for, for teachers. Uh, the Soviet Union was the first per place in the world to bring in, uh, to, to initiate special education and really take seriously the needs of, uh, of people with, with, with the disabilities. So I think that's why we, we, we can be inspired by the Russian Revolution. If you think now, you know, all the new technology, all the science we have, it could be, you know, ten times that kind of intellectual renaissance. But we need the revolution to do that. If we're going to have that, that inspiration again, we need the revolution. It's the only the revolution that's also going to stop global warming that will, act, you know, is, is, is challenging civilization itself. Okay, um, uh, on Christian's correction, I thought I'd said that the lessons of October by Trotsky were published in 1924, but uh, the camera never lies, so it'll say, it'll show what I actually said. Um, I do, do want to say, I don't want to engage particularly with the people from what Tariq Ali memorably, memorably called the international Satanist tendency. Um, <laughs> who tried to parasitize on our discussions. But I just do want to say one thing. Oh, one of them said that the position of Tony Cliff was if you had to choose between the Stalinist bureaucracy and Western imperialism, we would choose Western imperialism. This is an absolute and total lie. The slogan that Cliff coined was neither Washington nor Moscow, but international socialism. <laughs> not Washington against, against Moscow. And I would say that the SWP has a very proud record of campaigning against Western imperialism and its various wars in the, in the, in the Middle East, uh, although apparently we're really responsible for those wars, which means that we're really important. Um, now, but I think it is worth saying something about the theory of state capitalism. What that was was an attempt to make sense of the process of destruction of the, the revolution that takes place under Stalin. And if you, you know, I mean, something like a million people died in the Great Terror in the second half of the 19, 1930s. Far more people died as a result of the forced collectivization of agriculture in the early 1930s. Now, the problem that the left had to live with for a very long time, and to some extent still do, was the identification of those horrors with socialism. What Cliff was able to show, it's true other people attempted it before him, but he did it in a much more rigorous and sophisticated way, that, that, was, that the collectivization, the terror, weren't the realization of socialism, but they were a process of counter-revolution that transformed the Soviet Union into an imperialist power with a capitalist base subject to the logic of capital accumulation but ideologically flying the flag of, of socialism. Now, someone talked about Russia since the collapse of the so Soviet Union. The flag of socialism has gone but there's still the attempt to rescue Russia as an imperialist power. I don't myself see much of a di difference between the official Communist Party and Putin. The official Communist Party are nostalgic for the old days in which Ru when Russian imperialism was, ca was carried out under the Soviet flag, Putin is trying to re rebuild Russian Im imperialism in the context of a world economy dominated by Western capitalism uh, in which Russia is a relatively marginalized force. But any re-emergence of the left in Russia will have to oppose both the remnants of Stalinism and the ex existing oligarchy of which Putin is the representative. Okay, back to the revolution. Judy Cox made really important points about the role of women in the, in the revolution, and it's an indication of one of the most important things about the revolution. I mean, Lenin himself, in 1905, said revolution is the festival of the oppressed. In other words, uh, a breakthrough, uh, a revolutionary upsurge of the masses opens up for all sorts of oppressed groups the possibility of emancipating themselves. And there was this moment in 1917 and the years afterwards where you see this, 
this, this, this happening. On the artistic front, among other things, I went, to, I was in New York uh, at the end of last year, and I went to a fantastic exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art, just from their own, I think, their own archives of the brilliant revolutionary art that flourished at the time of the revolution. It's worth saying that women also played a very important part in the revolutionary movement before 1917. One of the good points in Tariq Ali's book is he traces the leading role of women, for example, in the various movements that attempted, and in one case su succeeded, in assassinating the Tsar in the late 19th century and so on. So it's part of a longer, longer story. This brings me to, I think it was Lewis's question about the social revolutionaries. The social revolutionaries were the mass movement that emerged from the Russian revolutionary movement of the late 19th century, which is a revolutionary movement that saw the peasants as the revolutionary class and used a variety of tactics, including very often terrorism, individual assassination and so on, as the way of overthrowing the monarchy and creating the conditions for peasant river, uh, liberation. One of the key differences then between the Marxists and crucially the Bolsheviks and the and the social revolutionaries was that the social revolutionaries had no concept of the self-emancipation of the working class. This proved crucial in the actual revolutions in Russia where the role of the working class became central in, deliberating, uh, sorry, in delivering the emancipation of the peasantry. And you see this very clearly in 1917. The, the dominant forces in the social revolutionary party become part of the political forces propping up the provisional government. And that means, in particular, they don't try and destabilize that government by pressing for land reform, by, by pressing for the land to the, to the peasants. They don't seek to implement their own program. The, after endless debates among Russian Marxists about what they should say about the agrarian question, in 1917, Lenin just cut through it and said, we should say, we're going to realize the social, social revolutionary program Simply get rid of the landowners and let the peasants take the land. And that was critical to the success of the Bolsheviks because it meant, as Lenin put, peasants didn't actively support the Bolsheviks, but they were neutral in the struggle between the Bolsheviks and the other, uh, and the other p parties because they recognized that the Bolshevik, with the Bolsheviks came the sweeping away of the landowners and if the other parties won the civil war, then the landowners would come back. And the tragedy of the social revolutionaries was that they ended up betraying their program. It's true, because the peasants were the largest section of the population, in the elections to the constituent assembly, the social revolutionaries uh, got the largest vote. The elections took place just after the October insurrection. But what we have then is a conflict between two forms of democracy the electoral democracy, the atomized voting, the essentially political uh, division of the population that are characteristic of bourgeois parliamentary representation and the self-organization, the Soviet form that we find among the workers and soldiers who made the, the, the revolution. Those two forms of democracy were c compatible incompatible with each other. They were in struggle between each other. And the constituent assembly became the political shell behind which the, the forces of counter-revolution gathered. That's why the Bolsheviks dispersed the constituent assembly. Okay, okay final point. Uh, someone asked about the question of historical time and revolutionary consciousness. Now, one way of thinking about this is... Um, to take an idea of the great Italian Marxist, Antonio Gramsci. Antonio Gramsci said the working class have a contradictory consciousness. And in a way, Gramsci, in talking about this contradictory consciousness, is talking about uneven and combined development reflected in the heads of workers. All the different um, phases of historical development, uh, Gramsci says, go going back even to the Stone Age, are reflected in the consciousness of the mass of workers. There can be, you know, essentially magical ideas going back to pre-capitalist society, you know, belief in the lottery or some, something like that. Gramsci hated the lottery. Um, 
uh, but also bourgeois ideas to do with individualism and enterprise and all that kind of stuff, but also socialist ideas coexisting, reflecting the different aspects of the workers' experience. So the, the, the differences in historical time coexist simultaneously in the heads of the mass of workers. And the struggle to win a revolutionary majority is really the struggle between the different elements of consciousness inside workers' heads. What's going to win out, win out? The reactionary elements, the really reactionary elements, nationalism, racism, the backward-looking elements, or are the more progressive socialist elements going to win out, win out? The test of effective revolutionary politics is to be able to play on those contradictions to pull larger and larger numbers of people to the left through the experience of struggle. As much as anything else, that's why 1917 is a model. Because the whole process where the Bolsheviks um, won a majority in the working class is an example of that unravelling of the contradictions inside workers' heads. It sets a benchmark for the rest of us to try and achieve.